just ahead on Black Issues Forum, Russia's moves around Ukraine prompt a stand for democracy, the inequality of inflation, and a wave of bomb threats at HBCUs comes to North Carolina. Stay with us. Welcome to Black Issues Forum. I'm Deborah Holt Noel. For weeks, national headlines have been all afire about the Russian threat to Ukraine and what this means for U.S. support for democracy throughout the world. On Wednesday, President Joe Biden addressed the nation to clarify the current threat and how the United States is responding. Right now, Russia has more than 150,000 troops encircling Ukraine and Belarus and along Ukraine's border. An invasion remains distinctly possible. That's why I've asked several times that all Americans in Ukraine leave now before it's too late to leave safely. If Russia does invade in the days and weeks ahead, the human cost for Ukraine will be immense. And the strategic cost for Russia will also be immense. Today, our NATO allies and the alliance is as unified and determined as it has ever been. And the source of our unbreakable strength continues to be the power, resilience, and universal appeal of our shared democratic values. The United States and our allies and partners around the world are ready to impose powerful sanctions on export controls, including actions that did not, we did not pursue when Russia invaded Crimea in eastern Ukraine in 2014. We'll put intense pressure on their largest and most significant financial institutions and key industries. These measures are ready to go as soon and if Russia moves. Let's get our panel's take on what's happening. I want to welcome political analyst Steve Rao, Forsyth County GOP Chair Harold Eustish, and Dr. Wilmer Leon of Sirius XM's Inside the Issues with Dr. Wilmer Leon. I want to open up with you, Steve. The president has already made clear the seriousness of this threat and what we're willing to do as a nation should the threat become an invasion. How do you measure the situation? Well, this is, continues to be an increasingly dangerous situation. You know, an invasion of Ukraine would be, would be the largest largest invasion of Western Europe since World War II. And I think the president uh, and other allies in Europe have done a good job of addressing how serious this crisis is by sending troops there, you know, France, Netherlands, the United States, uh, everybody uh, sending troops, having a strong presence, and then also the economic sanctions, which I think are very important. I think Putin's reasons for invading, in my opinion, are twofold. One, to weaken Ukraine to uh, minimize the ties with the West and also uh, NATO. And, um, but I think he also realizes the reasons to not invade still, uh, which gives us leverage in these negotiations, is the economic devastation this would have on Russia, uh, yeah. hurting their oil and gas exports, uh, you know, driving Europe into a recession. Gas prices are already up 300 percent. During the Gulf War many years ago in the 90s, Oil prices went up 17 percent, so we could face a major energy crisis. So I think he realizes that. And at the end of the day, Deb, I think Putin realizes that by just threatening war, he could perhaps be calling a bluff and wanting concessions. You know, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, said that NATO could be off the table. And, you know, it, and President Biden, I think, is doing what he has to do with the combination of deterrence and diplomacy. Uh, to try to figure out whether we could avoid conflict. And um, Putin is pushing it, you know, as far as he can. Harold, how do you read the situation, particularly Biden's um, response so far? Well, I think part of the issue with, with the president's response was what happened last year. I think Russia had several cyber attacks uh, against um, uh, the United States, against uh, companies that we have here. And the president's response and the administration's response was, well, if, if we're, we'll only act strongly if you attack these certain industries that they named, which I think gave Putin this sort of uh, emboldened him and said, you know, well, the United States is, under Biden isn't going to react strongly to, to the things I do. And so that, that has led so, somewhat, I think, led to this. Um, in, in addition to that, uh, I think the president's press conference with regard to calling it uh, 
potentially an incursion rather than an invasion. And, and, and the White House said that was a misstep. But I do think that um, we've got to have a stronger response. I mean, I, I, do we need to uh, send troops to Ukraine? No. But uh, I think Putin needs to know that uh, the United States will not back down and won't tolerate uh, his actions at all. What and would be a stronger response than threatening sanctions, you think? Well, I, I think it, it's, it's, it's full-throatedly not, you know, allowing Putin to say, allow, allowing Putin to maybe just go in a little bit to Ukraine and saying that, you know, um, we will do whatever it takes to aid Ukraine, uh, to give them every bit of arms needed, which we are giving them arms, but do everything it takes to repel him in every single way and be full-throated about it. So stronger words, um, stronger words. Dr. Leon, uh, what are your thoughts, and particularly where Putin is um, in this situation at this moment? He sent more troops out, and so it seems really close. The, clo the longer things go on, Biden is saying this is just about certain. Um, what are his choices if he doesn't want to invade or do something more? Well, this is really a fiction created by Joe Biden. Uh, the first thing that Americans need to understand is that Russia is a sovereign country. That means that they are able to move their troops anywhere within their country, within their borders that they want to. And the United States has no right, has no business trying to tell a sovereign nation what to do with its own forces. Where is the evidence that Russia is going to invade the Ukraine? None has been presented. We've seen this movie before. It was called Iran. I'm sorry, it was called, it was called Iraq. It was called Weapons of Mass Destruction. It was called Yellow Cake Uranium Coming from Niger. Where is all of that stuff? Well, how, well, how do it we interpret? How do we interpret the surrounding of Ukraine by these Russian forces? What, well, what was that? What you do? What you do is you expand the map, and you look at the fact that NATO and American forces are act. There are more NATO and American forces surrounding Russia than there are Russian forces at the border. Estonia, Latvia. Lithuania, Poland, Romania, those are all NATO countries that have NATO and U.S. forces surrounding Russia. And Secretary of State James Baker promised Russia that NATO would not move any further east. And that's all that NATO has done. And so Putin is finally saying, enough of this, folks. I'm not going to let you put more missiles in Ukraine and in Dane and threaten Russia. We're not playing this game. And, and, and Putin is not joking. This comes down to the adage from the corner, don't start nothing, won't be nothing. <laughs> and this no really <laughs> also has to do with primarily energy and the fact that Russia and Germany have, have built the Nord Stream 2 pipeline which has taken $7 billion of gas transit fees away from Ukraine, and the United States wants to sell natural gas to Europe. That's what this is really all about, is the United States trying to control the energy market. Yeah. Well, what happens in Russia could indeed impact gas prices and further stress an already inflated economy. So let's talk a little bit about this this worry about inflation. And if you've filled your tank lately or done a double take at the grocery store, you're seeing these prices go up. You're not imagining things. And economists are blaming inflation. Of course, this is hitting low and middle income Americans the hardest. And all the fun we've been having with low interest rates is coming to a rude end. Steve, you know, is inflation out of control or is this part of the cycle? Well, I think, you know, clearly it, it, it's a, a, a situation that's becoming increasingly worse. I mean, inflation is around 7.5%. It was, you know, uh, higher in the late 70s, uh, in the beginning of the decade, up to a high as about 12%. And I think the inflation that we're seeing is really the result of, you know, so much money in the economy, which is what a lot of the Republicans say with all the stimulus, uh, supply chain disruptions, you know, China's no-COVID policy. Uh, we're, we're in the Olympics right now, about to end it. 
uh, the Winter Olympics, but uh, that's you know shut down a lot of manufacturing plants. But but Deb, I, I think at the end of the day, um, you know the economists that say, well, it's not that bad. Unemployment is down. Here's the deal. You know, unlike unemployment, which only affects a small percentage of the population, inflation affects everybody, right? And so for those families, black families, poor families, people that are, you know, spending so much more of their money on buying groceries, on paying more for gas, and let's not forget housing prices, especially where we live in North Carolina, housing prices are going up, right? So we need more affordable housing. And so I think we have to be realistic that it's easy for an economist to say, well, it's not that bad, you know, unemployment is down, uh, we have a labor shortage, the economy, stock market is up, but this is really affecting the lives of, of people in America. And so it's gonna really come down to raising interest rates while not slowing down the economy and um, making sure that we are make, being sensitive to how this is affecting people's pocketbooks and their savings. What are your thoughts, Harold? Because uh, what Steve has said, you know, this is coming down and it's gonna impact uh, the middle class is going to impact, you know, working Americans. Um, what are your thoughts about next steps in terms of uh, the policies that are still out there that the administration is fighting for, like, you know, continuing to fight for a part of Build Back Better or pieces of it? Uh, what, what, what can we expect? Well, as Steve alluded to, I think part of the problem is, you know, we have the supply chain issues, which are partly with COVID, but we also have a country that has uh, amassed a, a, quite a bit of savings because of the influx of money that has gone to people via the government. And, and I think the luckily, luckily we have Joe Manchin who stopped uh, the administration's um, onslaught of giving government money away to, to people, um, which I don't think would help the situation. You know, really right now the average person, two, two thirds of people in the United States don't have $500 for an emergency. Um, and so ultimately the average pe person is feeling this I think it's going to have uh, major, major issues for the administration when it comes to the midterm elections. Um, I think it'll play a major role and in, in, in ultimately, you know, see, you know, uh, Republicans win 40 or maybe even 50 seats in Congress because of this, because the average person is feeling this in such a distinct way. So all of this money that came in from COVID, you're saying people are saving it or, or they're not saving well, it because they don't even well, have enough, you know, savings to prepare for well, inflation and a, and a hardship. Right, I mean, so the, the the average person still doesn't have $500, but there there is a large percentage of the population that does have savings at this point and can't, and, and so when you can't spend it, um, you don't have, this is a supply chain issue, that's where this inflation is coming from. So I think, you know, what, what the administration shouldn't do is have more money you know, influx into the economy. I think, of course, the feds are going to take care of some of that. But I also think politically, it's just it's just one of those issues that, uh, whether it's the president's fault directly or not, uh, it is going to stand at the feet of the president of the Democratic Party and be, uh, you know, hashed out in the midterms. Well, what's your take on this, um, Dr. Leon? Because th the inflation is is happening, it's growing. Um, there's going to be blame shifted to the people who are in charge right now. And are there missteps that they're taking right now with regard to trying to either control inflation or control the narrative? Uh, the misstep that the current administration is taking is trying to turn this over to the Fed to have the Fed solve the problem by raising interest rates. Because this is not, this inflation is not from people wanting to buy too many things. That's not what's going on here. What we're seeing is a global supply side problem that changing interest rates is only going to make the situation worse than make the situation better. Because when you, ri when you raise interest rates, what do you do? You make the cost of buying a house more expensive. You make the cost of buying a car more expensive. You make money that small businesses would want to go to their banks and borrow. You make that money more expensive. So that's really going to exacerbate the situation. That's not going to solve the situation. And the 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 uh, money from Build Back Better or whatever the program was that uh, that was injecting money into the economy during COVID, 
That has absolutely nothing to do with this. Because when you look at the timing of when that money was in, injected into the economy and you look at when inflation started, there's way too much time between those two events to say that one caused the other. And what did people that received those benefits do with that money? They did they it. go out and buy boats? Did they go out and buy televisions? Did they go out and buy cars? No. What did they do? They bought food. They bought food. They paid rent. Yeah. That, they, they, they did the things that they were normally going to do, but because of COVID, didn't have the money to do at the time. So really blaming that in injection of capital into the economy at that time is really a Republican excuse for not wanting to take care of Americans. That's what that is. Steve, let me give you just a minute as we wrap up this particular segment. You know, what, what are your thoughts on raising the interest rate and, you know, solutions to inflation? Well, I mean, as you know, economists will tell you, and in, in, in the history of our country, when we had the crisis in 1979, when President Carter was in the White House, uh, we did uh, raise interest rates, um, and it was the balance between not interest, not raising interest rates too fast, where you really slow economic growth. So I think we have to tread with caution. Uh, in terms of just doing drastic rises of interest rates because we don't want to contract the economy, especially after a pandemic. But traditionally, I would say, you know, but I think at the end of the day, it, you know, it's up, it, it will be up to the Fed. And, and they, they really haven't, you know, made a clear decision of what they're going to do. But I do believe that it would be a way to counter it. Um, and eventually, inflation, you know, other nations around the world have dealt with inflation. Uh, many around the world, sometimes thousands of percent of inflation. And it really comes down to making sure that you're developing and implementing economic policies. Um, but I agree with Dr. Leon that I, I think that the, the money that we pumped into the economy was necessary to keep the economy moving and to put money in the hands of people that were struggling uh, during a pandemic. So I don't think it's fair to just blame and say, well, it's just, you know, because we put a lot of money in the economy, I think we were doing our job um, in the administration. Well, the regardless of who's to blame, Americans had better buckle up because we'll see either way with what, what happens in Russia, with what happens with inflation, um, people need to be prepared for the economy to change. A wave of bomb threats to HBCUs across the nation has hit home here in North Carolina. On Wednesday, both Fayetteville State University and Winston-Salem State University received bomb threats. That brings the count to 17 reports of bomb threats to HBCUs since the start of Black History Month. No explosives have been discovered on any of the campuses, and FBI investigations have named six persons of interest, all teenagers, who appear to have been racially motivated. Dr. Leon, what does this attention tell you about what's happening in our nation? What this tells me is that the, the racial hatred that has been uh, endemic in this country uh, since people of color arrived on these shores in, in 1619 is alive and well and living in America. It tells me that these kids are listening to their parents and that these kids are listening uh, to social media and that they are internalizing the, the, the racism and the hatred that, again, has been pandemic uh, uh, or endemic in this country since the country was founded. Uh, we were expecting if we, we many people that heard a lot of this uh, were expecting that it was going to be adults, that it was going to be skinhead, that it was going to be neo-Nazis. Uh, this just shows you the power of the Internet, the power of social media and how pervasive and how deep this racism runs in, in America. And I say this as a uh, gr as a proud graduate uh, as a Hamptonian, and I say this also as a Howardite uh, graduate of, of two HBCUs, um, that I'm surprised that this hasn't happened sooner, uh, honestly. Well, I don't know about surprise, but it is very uh, disconcerting to me 
also that it's young people. It's disconcerting, period, that this is happening. Mm -hmm. And the reaction, the response seems to be just, well, this is a shame that this is happening and uh, the FBI and I will do what investigations it can. And then we move on. Uh, but, but Harold, just I wanted really to quickly. get your thought. Just, re just really quickly. Yes. How old was Dylan Roof, the, the, the shooter of, of Mother Emanuel? See, this is, that, they're all linked. Mother Emanuel. Yeah, the church in South Carolina where Dylan Roof went in and shot up, uh, killed like, what, 19 people? Nine. In, or nine, nine how many, yeah. I can't remember. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. How, how, old, how old was Dylan Roof? I'm, what, so I'm, I'm looking at that atrocity, mm -hmm. looking at these bomb threats against HBCUs, and I'm looking at the age of the perpetrators to see a trend. So that, that's opinion. the focus. Harold, let me get your thoughts about all of this. What do you, what do you think? I agree with Dr. Leon. I think the, the, the fact that these are young people, I, I think, made me sort of raise eyebrows. I thought the same thing is going to be an, an adult, adults doing this. And, and I think it's, it's even more concerning on some level that it's children. Of course, I'm happy that there are no um, actual, you know, physical threats in the sense that there haven't been any, any bombs found. But um, HBCUs are, are extremely important to our country. They're extremely important to, of course, the black community as a whole. I mean, uh, my family has many, many HBCU graduates. My brother went to Howard a and I, I started at Morehouse. So I, I, you know, it's near and dear to my heart. And, uh, you know, it, it, it shows that the HBCUs are still needed, without a doubt. And um, they, they ought to be protected in every sense. And, and I hope that the FBI does a full investigation and, and, and brings these young people to, to justice. And also, we make sure that we um, highlight our HBCUs and everything that they have done in extremely positive ways for not only just the black community, but our country as a whole. Absolutely, and I'll, I'll do a shout out to my two alma maters as well, Howard University and St. Augustine's University. Certainly, um, HBCUs have had a very significant uh, role in my development. Uh, growing up as a military kid, getting to go to an HBCU, I got to be exposed to a complete uh, student body of, of brown people of African Americans from all parts of the nation. And it exposed to me the great intelligence and the great variety um, of people who, who are in my own ethnic community. Uh, Steve, you know, it is disturbing that these are young people and we see some of this play out even not in terms of bomb threats, but in the high schools uh, in, in action and so forth. But, you know, what, are, what do you think um, could be done more than what's being done? Or do you think that, that, that uh, authorities are on track with just investigating this? Well, I, and I've said this on the show before. I mean, I think uh, just like any disease, uh, we, we talk a lot about COVID and the pandemic, but one of the greatest diseases that this country has faced is racism, which courses through the veins of, of Americans uh, from the hip founding of this nation. And at the end of the day, I think we have to really realize that racism and white supremacy and systemic racial bias are serious problems in America. And we need to make sure that we just face it um, and deal with it, whether it's in cities developing policies or in states or in the federal government that um, are looking into this issue, making sure that we uh, try to eliminate racial bias and making sure that we do work with the authorities that this kind of these kinds of acts that are full of hate and white supremacy uh, have to be called out and we have to address it. And but we know that we've yeah. seen we know that we've seen a rise in these in the last yes. uh, year or so. And, and, and the fact that it's on Black History Month, a month when we're celebrating black, black brilliance and the remarkable contributions of black Americans, these kinds of attacks are coming. And I think that, you know, it's just um, we have to come together as all Americans, black Americans, white Americans, Asian Americans, all Americans, every citizen in this country, and send a message to our children or grandchildren that we don't want to be a racist nation. But we have to face it and say that it's a problem. We can't act like we're going to all hold hands and, and get along. Key words, um, face it. Got to face it. That means, you know, it. looking at the truth. That means studying the truth, knowing the history. Dr. Leon, I'm going to give you the last word. We've got about 30 seconds here. Um, it's Black History Month, and here come these threats. Do you think there's a, a time? We also, we also have to understand that we have to stop looking at these events as though they're uh, isolated incidents 
and we have to start connecting these dots and understanding that each of these is, a, is an element of a much larger problem instead of trying to look at them as, as one-offs. No, this is a deep, deep issue that is, that, is, that is plaguing this country, and as long as we continue to treat them as isolated incidents, we will never get to the root of the problem. Dr. Wilmer Leon, thank you so much, as well as Harold Eustish and Steve Rao. Always a pleasure to have you on Black Issues Forum. Pleasure to be here. Have a great weekend. Thank you, as always. I want to thank all of our guests for joining us today. We invite you to engage with us on Twitter or Instagram using the hashtag Black Issues Forum. You can also find our full episodes on pbsnc.org slash Black Issues Forum or listen at any time on Apple iTunes, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. For Black Issues Forum, I'm Deborah Holt-Noel. Thanks for watching. through the financial contributions of viewers like you who invite you to join them in supporting PBSNC.